Hi, everyone. Thanks for being with us today. I'm Wendy Caldwell, the coordinator of the Monarch Joint Venture. We're excited to be continuing this series with a presentation on gardening for monarchs and community action. I'm excited to welcome today's presenters. And starting things off will be Donna Van Buchen, who is the executive director of Wild One's Native Plants Natural Landscapes. Then we'll hear from Mary Phillips and Patrick Fitzgerald of the National Wildlife Federation. Mary is the director of NWS Garden for Wildlife campaign, and Patrick leads the volunteer programs in the in NWS Community Wildlife Habitat program. Again, please feel free to ask questions in the, in the chat area on your screen, and we will try to get to them in a question and answer period after the presentation. With that, I'll turn it over to Donna for our first speaker. I've been asked to talk about gardening with native plants today. And gardening with native plants is not much different than gardening with non-native plants. The big difference really is just the use of the hardiness zone map. Most non-native plant gardeners refer to the plant hardiness zone map, which gives you different ranges of temperatures that they can use to determine whether a plant might um, be successfully grown in that range. The hardiness zone map, like I mentioned, just depends entirely upon the temperatures for those ranges. Native plant gardeners, however, like to use the ecoregions map, which shows us more information and allows us to plant the right plant in the right place. For example, the, the ecoregions map will show you wind, soil type, soil moisture, humidity, even things as small as the pH in the soil are very important to the success of growing a plant. And native plants are, grow more successfully if planted in the right place. So why do native plants grow more successfully? And, and why, why is, what is the difference between uh, the native plant and the non-native plant? In most cases, as this slide shows uh, for a prairie plant, the native plant has a robust, very large, root system. That root system helps it draw its nutrients and the moisture from the soil rather than having you, the gardener, provide the tender loving care, which most often is extra water, uh, perhaps fertilizer, maybe uh, a pesticide if you're concerned about the plant eating, being eaten by insects and, dis and thus destroying the plant. Most native plants, if they're attacked by insects, will not be destroyed simply because the insects evolved with the native plants and therefore uh, will, are dependent upon the native plants. And so they typically won't destroy a native plant. But as you can see from these immense root systems that the native plants, particularly the prairie native plants, have, all of their nutrients and moisture can be drawn directly from the soil without our having to add that uh, substance for their success. In this next diagram, you'll see the, the uh, root system of the Kentucky bluegrass. The Kentucky bluegrass, because it's kept so short primarily, has a very short root system. And therefore, the gardener or the person who's maintaining the lawn has to provide fertilizer, has to water it continuously in order to keep it lush and green, and maybe even has to provide um, insect repellent or uh, Insect, uh, insecticide in order to keep the grass healthy and successfully growing. But there are other things that uh, are important to gardeners using native plants, and those are the things that are more personally involved with our own well-being. For example, uh, provenance. Uh, since native plants were the first, they're the origin of all uh, other plants, um, it, it gives us a sense of place. It, it provides us that knowledge of provenance that the origin of from where we, we came and from where the plants came, where all wildlife came. And then, of course, there's biodiversity, which is the, the, all the species that evolve together, including plants, animals, fungus, soil, um, all that biodiversity makes up a community of plants. And that then leads us to sustainability, which is the heart of what we are looking for when we use native plants. Native plants, for the most part, are sustainable. Not only do they not require the tender, loving care that is so important to maintaining non-native plants, typically, it also provides us an opportunity to live lightly on the land. 
So why are native plants important? Because they're personal. They give us a sense of place. They provide food, shelter, water, space for native uh, insects, native animals. Uh, native animals help to transport the seeds, uh, many times providing um, assist for pollinators and other insects and wildlife that are dependent on the native plants. Look at how many seeds could be dispersed on the hide of that buffalo. And of course, there are birds. The birds depend upon the uh, seed for their food. They depend upon the uh, plant itself for its shelter. And very often, they raise their young in the native plants. So they evolve together with the native plants, just like the insects and the animals did. So how does nature work? Uh, most people are familiar with the circle of life and how it works. It's, uh, it's a beautiful cycle. It's the basis of which the food chain is developed. Plants have the only life forms that absorb sunlight energy through photosynthesis and use that energy to build or produce plant material from water, carbon dioxide in the air, and nutrients from the soil. In the process of doing that, they, they emit oxygen that you and I breathe and make our life much more comfortable. I know you can't read this slide probably, but I wanted to make you aware that it, what it says is that there are a number of caterpillars, moths, and butterflies that use native plants. In particular, I wanted to mention that oak, which is the very first item listed in this listing, supports 557 species of caterpillars, moths, and butterflies, while lilacs, which is further down on the list, only supports 40 species. So given that information, Information, it just seems like it would make sense to provide native plants, native woody plants, to enhance the life cycle of moths, butterflies, and caterpillars. We want to talk about, bio, we mentioned talk, uh, earlier biodiversity. Um, thinking in terms of biodiversity and the, the list of woody plants we just looked at, consider the sugar maple. Sugar maple supports 300 species of caterpillars where the Norway maple, which is a non-native species, only supports zero. Or think about the chickadee. The chickadee feeds 300 and more caterpillars to its young in a day and requires that amount of food for the entire time that the young are in their nest. If we didn't have native plants like oaks to provide those caterpillars, we would lose the lovely sound of the chickadees or the or the ability to watch them in flight. There are other functions of the sugar maple as well. For example, they provide pollen for our, in our uh, flowers and our other insects, seeds. They provide a, an opportunity for nesting and roosting for birds, bats, rodents, and more wildlife than we could probably imagine. And then, of course, they also provide fertilizer, natural fertilizer for our soil. A birdscaped yard mimics nature. Uh, you can see from this brief diagram that there are various layers to gardening with native plants in order to create a habitat. And that vegetation is very important, and we should consider that when we are designing our landscaping. And lastly, sustainability. Uh, sustainability with native plants means a living landscape. And wouldn't this be more appealing, this picture be more appealing to you than this one, which shows today's lawn? Today's gardeners are often obsessed with, with a perfect lawn. Think about how much time and money is spent maintaining our lawns and how many people love to mow their lawns. Certainly you know neighbors and friends who think that they have to mow their lawn every week, if not every two or three days. So why are lawns um, not a living landscape? They're very high maintenance, as I mentioned. They uh, use up a lot of time and effort to maintain. We waste a lot of potable drinking water. Uh, the water runs off into our streets, into our storm sewers, polluting our wa waterways. Uh, the fossil fuels used in the equipment that we use to mow our lawns contributes to the pollution in the air and global warming. Just to give you a little bit more uh, information about what we do to our lawns and often what we do to our gardens and certainly our, our crops, we have added a lot of fertilizer. 
in order to make our lawns and our gardens lush and green, our non-native gardens and our lawns lush and green. This chart says that we use nearly 25 million short tons or 50 billion pounds of fertilizer every year. And it just seems to me that removing these elements from the ground to place them on top of the ground when they could be taken up by the deep roots of native plants automatically would save everyone a lot of work. Another thing that we should think about when we're talking about uh, lawn particularly is that the average homeowner uses about 30% of their water for watering their lawns. And landscaping uses about 33% of all residential water for irrigation, uh, not only golf courses, but also our personal homes. Watering a garden or lawn consumes a considerable amount of water, and it's important for us to think about where our drinking water is going to come from the future. So why native plants? It's a living landscape. If you want to keep it once a month, um, if you'd like to continue to, to mow your lawn and maybe keep it once a month uh, to a minimum height, like a turf lawn, you might try using a no-mow lawn. No-mow lawns are made up of fine fescue grasses, and they thrive in sun or partial shade. Uh, many of them are made up of almost all native grasses, but many have some non-native grasses as well. But the fact is that they grow a minimum height of 12 inches a year, and you wind up being able to get away with mowing them once a month rather than once every week or even every two or three days. So try a, a no-mow lawn if you're concerned about um, having a nice turf lawn in your yard. Here's an example of one used around a bed. And I like to use this photo because it shows the uh, very short grass of the lawns in the background. So why do we want to use native plants? We want to get away from the non-living landscape of the turf grass, and we want to uh, try to get away from providing all the TLC for non-native plants. So we want to talk about sustainability and those benefits and, and try to impress others as well as ourselves with using native plants and why to use them. As I've mentioned before, they require no watering, fertilizer, or pesticides. Once they're established, they will live very well on their own. Uh, most insects are beneficial to them. Sh studies show that over time, natural landscapes are more cost effective because they do not require that constant care. So you have more time to spend time with your family. And we've talked about water pollution, uh, the native plants through their little feeder roots that die off every year and regrow, provide space to filter the pollutants that go into our water table and into our streams and, and lakes, rivers. The deep root systems hold the soil together, therefore preventing erosion. And as we mentioned earlier, they provide food and shelter for our indigenous wildlife. A natural landscape, a living landscape, reconnects us with nature. And isn't it wonderful that we can have nature in our own yards? I like to use this quote from Lori Otto, who was the inspiration for the founding of Wild Ones. And I hope it will find you uh, some peace of mind as you read it as well, because it certainly rings true today if we use, non if we use native plants in our gardening and in our landscaping. So just in kind of conclusion here, when I'm talking about native plants, I want to just mention again that we want to grow native plants for wildlife, reptiles, and insects. Here's a picture of the sphinx moth for monarchs. As many of you probably know, monarchs require milkweed There's, uh, for their procreation. Monarchs only lay eggs on milkweed. And they, like many animals, are specialists in what they need to survive as from one generation to the next. Here we see the monarchs nectaring on uh, red milkweed. Here again, they are very particular about what they like to nectar on, although they will nectar on other native plants. And here's that picture of that chickadee again. I like to use this one because I'm always so amazed by the number of caterpillars that this one little bird can hold in its beak 
as it flies back to its nest to feed its young. And of course, why native plants? For our children. I hope you'll agree that it is all worthwhile when it comes to our children. I wanted to talk a little bit about Lepidoptera, Lepidoptera because we have such an emphasis of protecting and continuing to enhance habitat for our pollinators. And so this little slide just kind of ex explains to you why it's important that we give this vast category of insects um, the opportunity to thrive. The monarchs in this photo are nectaring on Joe Pye weed. I was also asked to say something about neonics, and so I wanted to present a few extra slides on pesticides. This diagram shows what the pesticide use is in the USA. It shows that the United States has increased its use of genetically engineered crops in the U.S. over the past 20 years. This has led to indiscriminate spraying of pesticides and herbicides throughout the crop growing lands. And that, of course, has led to the death of many of our native insects, uh, not only because of the genetically enhanced crops and the use of the pesticides, but also because of loss of habitat. This graph explains the decrease in the monarch population as the use of herbicide tolerant crops have increased over the past 20 years. It's kind of scary. This uh, next slide shows what it looks like when you try to feed monarch larvae on plants that have been grown with pesticides. Not a very pretty sight. And this slide is of a farmer Plant, uh, planting his genetically engineered herbicide seed in, his, in, a, in one of his fields. The half-life of this neonic is 1,091 days. At the end of the growing season, only two-thirds of that pesticide will have been used up, so the remainder is still in the soil, and it continues to percolate into the water table. I'm sure you've all heard about the story in the newspaper about the spraying of the linden trees in Portland, Oregon that killed off such a huge amount of bumblebees, which has led, of course, then to some uh, federal legislation to try to thwart the use of, of some of these neonics. There are a number of documents on the website. I'm sure you'll be able to find them if you Google them. But um, President Obama has issued um, an order a on the national strategy to promote the health of honeybees and other pollinators. There's also um, a memorandum that came out following the trilateral committee's meeting last spring that is developing a strategy to promote the health of honeybees and pollinators. And there's a guideline and fact sheet that go along with this that shows what the economic impact is on the loss of honeybees and pollinators. So I encourage you to go to your website and browse, these, browse for these documents. So where do you get native plants? Reputable local native uh, nurseries are the best place, but when you go to them, you want to ask for straight native species, not just native species. Very often they will provide you with a cultivar or a nativar of that straight species, and that is not the same. Those are not the same plants that evolved with our native insects and our native wildlife. You can get them through mail order. You can select uh, local species, only local species, if you have native plant nurseries in your area. I would suggest that you go to them first before ordering plants from two or three states away. Avoid wildflowers in a can. Uh, wildflowers in a can typically do not contain native plants, and if they do, it's such a small portion that you won't do any good for your wildlife. And above all, do not take the, wild, the plants from the wild. If you're walking in a lovely park, a natural area, hiking on a trail, and you see a lovely native plant, leave it there. Likely you won't be able to provide the same conditions for it to be successfully transplanted, and you'll lose that plant and never see it again. 
I thank you for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them in the past. Uh, I've always talked to people, and I've been able to see your eyes and, and get the expressions on your face. And so I have felt that I have gotten through to it, my audience. Today is a little different, uh, but I trust that you will ask any questions that I've left unanswered. Thank you. Thanks so much, Donna. Before I turn it over to Mary and Patrick, I just wanted to remind everybody that, that you can ask questions of Donna in the chat box, and we will come back to them at a question and answer period at the end. So with that, take it away, Mary. Thank you very much. Um, we're just so excited to be here, both Patrick Fitzgerald and myself um, from the National Wildlife Federation. And Donna really did an amazing job of capturing the real needs for gardening in a way that, that helps uh, wildlife habitats and, and monarchs in particularly. Uh, our vision, uh, at, well, who we are, is the National Wildlife Federation. And we really are trying to be a voice for wildlife, um, and we're dedicated to protecting that wildlife and habitat, and also inspiring future generations of conservationists. Uh, nationwide, uh, we have uh, 49 state and territorial affiliate organizations and a network of over 6 million uh, members and supporters across the country. We've been very fortunate over the last 40 years to be able to steward a program called uh, Certified Wildlife Habitat and Gardening for Wildlife. And um, our vision, and if we could have the, I'll get to the next slide there. Um, our, our vision there is really creating habitat where people live, work, play, learn, and worship. And we're really, our vision for this is, is much of what uh, Donna shared so eloquently of creating these living landscapes uh, where life is really abundant, life on many, many levels. And we feel that that's such an inspiration to so many gardeners uh, to create habitat, um, obviously not only for monarchs, but um, the whole ecosystem of wildlife. The, as, as you, many of you are familiar with, uh, particularly habitat is so important now, and the public is really rallying, um, in understanding these pressing issues the, the monarch butterfly is facing, um, the decline in habitat uh, and the population over the last 90 percent over the last two decades, and um, one third of the summer breeding habitat being destroyed. As Donna mentioned, it's a flagship species. It's iconic. People are rallying around it and helping to understand the full plight of pollinators and other habitats. Sorry, we're having, there we go. Um, as I mentioned, for over 40 years, uh, the National Wildlife Federation, through its Garden for Wildlife efforts and its survival wildlife habitats, um, as well as its grassland work and uh, recovering and protecting large-scale land, large landscapes, have been helping pollinators and monarchs. And particularly um, with the, the basic elements of habitat, food, water, cover, and places to raise young. Uh, these are the elements that everyone are required uh, to create the habitats and that we like to recognize through our program and through their uh, many efforts. Specifically, we have launched a monarch pollinator conservation plan and are working in four areas to make Americans really understand this pressing issue and to make a direct difference for monarchs and pollinators. What's so exciting, we feel that creating habitat gardens uh, using all the elements that Donna described uh, of native plants, being ecologically appropriate, not using pesticides, is a personal conservation act and a meaningful, accessible act to help uh, the environment and wildlife that anybody can make. And that's what's so powerful, and I think why so many people are rallying to this effort. So that's what we're hoping to inspire and build a movement of Americans um, on a continued basis. Uh, then also, we're doing very specific work to create and restore habitat on the migratory corridors and larger landscapes, particularly the Central Flyway, um, and uh, specific work in the states of Texas, Missouri, in other states in the Midwest, and the Great Lakes. And throughout that, we're looking, and, and Patrick Fitzgerald, my colleague, is going to talk a little bit more about our community wildlife habitats and the work we're going to be doing in those corridors. But we really have a, a broad range of efforts from our individual certified wildlife habitats to the community wildlife habitats, schoolyard habitats, and also engaging faith-based groups in sacred ground. 
Uh, the other uh, piece is that we are hoping to really recruit thousands of new monarch um, and pollinator gardens where people live, work, play, learn, and worship. And that's already been increasing uh, our partnership with the National Pollinator Garden Network uh, and the Million Pollinator Garden Challenge has also helped to raise the awareness around this issue, um, both for greater pollinators and specifically monarchs. So we're hoping through these efforts and through these partnerships, including our partnership with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and our MOU to help save the monarch, um, and the, the efforts that Patrick's going to share with you in a minute, really getting kind of boots on the ground to create more and more acres and acres of um, pollinator monarch-friendly habitat. And then on a big picture, we're educating and building consumer demand for regional native milkweed and nectar plants. That's part of our messaging in Garden for Wildlife, and also a new tool that we're going to have available in the spring, and it really speaks to the Lepidopterida uh, points that Donna had shared. It's a database that uh, Dr. Doug Tallamy of the University of Delaware helped us uh, create, and um, it's going to provide a variety of tools. Hold on one second. Sorry, I was having a little technical <laughs> difficulty. Uh, this is just a, a real uh, simple mock-up, but what it is is going to allow gardeners to host an abundance of butterflies, moths, and attract birds by providing them with customized native plant lists by county. And we're um, hoping that will be live by spring, and people will be able to put in the types of butterflies and moths they're interested in, that are attracting, that are native to their area, and it will give them a plant list of the top 10 uh, or 20 woody species, herbaceous species, um, to actually plant to increase those numbers. So the chickadee will have those 300 plus caterpillars they need to feed their young. And um, people who want to, for example, support the Maryland state butterfly, the Baltimore checker spot, they'll know that they need to plant the turtle head plant um, in their yard um, in significant you know, quantities. So these are the kinds of tools we're hoping to create, uh, not to create, we will have <laughs> through Garden for Wildlife um, coming uh, this spring. Uh, Dr. Chalamy and his research group um, have helped us actually catalog over 11,000 species of Lepidopterida um, and 3,500 uh, 3, plant genera, um, host plants. So this is something we're uh, very excited about to share with folks. And this was funded uh, by the U.S. Forest Service um, and, of course, the efforts of the University of Delaware. We have many affiliates that are active in Garden for Wildlife and habitat creation across the country, and this is just a sample of some of the ones um, that are uh, doing a number of educational uh, programs and outreach. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Patrick to talk about our community wildlife habitat. Thanks, Mary. Um, hello, everyone. Um, to illustrate the kinds of community actions that you can take to help support the monarch, um, I'm going to share some information with you about the National Wildlife Federation's Community Wildlife Habitat Program and how it supports pollinator gardening and monarch butterfly conservation at the local level. Um, the National Wildlife Federation partners with cities, towns, counties, homeowners associations, um, and, and others to um, create wildlife habitat and to educate and engage the, the community locally. Uh, most communities are working to create pollinator and monarch habitat in particular. Uh, today we have 144 communities participating in the program, ranging from large cities like Austin and Houston uh, to Baltimore and Charlotte and, and many others. Uh, we have some high concentrations of participating communities in the Puget Sound near Seattle, uh, Broward County in South Florida, and uh, the D.C. metro area. Uh, the program is, is growing at a rapid pace um, with 100 applications and 20 new communities joining uh, just in the last year. Uh, we're very excited about that. That's more than double the year before. Um, and as we move forward, we hope to recruit and engage more communities, especially along that critical central migratory flyway for the monarch butterfly. So each community is led by a core team of, co of local community leaders, such as mayors, city council members, uh, city park planning or sustainability directors, environmental action committee members, um, leadership from homeowners associations and, and uh, community mm -hmm. groups. Uh, it, it varies uh, by, by every community, but a, a team is formed. 
And the first thing that you have to do to become a community wildlife habitat is um, to actually create and restore wildlife habitat uh, by certifying a certain number of individual properties within the community. Um, this is based on a, a community's population, and uh, teams will oftentimes uh, certify uh, some of these sites as, as monarch way stations or um, uh, NABA butterfly uh, certification and, and do others. And really what the community is trying to do through the program is create uh, get entire communities involved uh, to have a bigger impact for wildlife and, and intentionally connecting certified properties and creating corridors for wildlife um, by connecting uh, habitats to natural or other riparian areas. The, the second part of becoming a community wildlife habitat really focuses on, um, it focuses on education and outreach. So, Part of the goal is to create habitat within the community, um, but the local team will also educate community members and take on service projects that support wildlife. We have a whole menu of options, and a few of them are up here on this slide, that allow communities to earn these points in ways that make sense for that community. Uh, the following slides illustrate some of these actions, and really local communities, um, whether you're working for a municipality or if you're just an advocate or a citizen, um, a lot of these actions can be taken whether you're part of the NWF Community Wildlife Habitat Program or not. I'm, I'm again just working to illustrate uh, some of these examples that, that have happened through some of our community partnerships. So I'll run through a few slides. Um, the Community Wildlife Habitat uh, lead community service projects like this uh, invasive species removal uh, that's happening in, in Kirkland, Washington. Others might do tree plantings, a bio blitz, or even a native plant rescue uh, for an area that may be uh, going under construction. They create demonstration gardens that include native milkweed and nectar plants at city hall, library, schools, uh, homeowners association, common areas, and, and really anywhere that citizens congregate. Uh, these demonstration gardens inspire others in the community to take action in their own yard. And uh, many communities will table and share information at uh, local events ranging from uh, a weekly farmer's market to big Earth Day events. Communities um, can uh, and do provide uh, native plant lists for their community, and, uh, and, and that's a wonderful resource that they can provide. Um, some even host native plant sales or giveaways. Um, all, there, there are many different special projects um, that you can take at the community level to help the monarch butterfly. Um, this is an example in, in Broward County, uh, Florida, in the Miami-Fort Lauderdale area. Um, NWF is working with the county and a local nonprofit called the Youth Environmental Alliance to plant 100 pollinator gardens um, in the next six months at schools, parks, and municip municipal buildings. And all of this is being done in in celebration of the county's centennial this year, and all of the gardens are including uh, native milkweed plants and uh, nectar plants that are being provided by a local native plant nursery. So the last uh, area that I wanted to talk about um, th that's really important at the community level is, is looking at what, what the community's policies are, um, ordinances and resolutions um, around native plants and landscaping and pesticides and uh, many different things. This is a, a resolution from Alpharetta, Georgia. I think I skipped the slide. Um, and th this is a policy resolution that was just passed a couple of months ago in Austin, Texas. And it encourages uh, the planting of native milkweed at city-owned buildings and lands. And this is really exciting. It's just a few lines of policy in, in this document, but Austin actually manages nearly 20,000 acres of land through Austin uh, Parks and Recreation Department, and another, another 7,000 they manage through their um, water utility. So that's, that's a lot of acreage in, in, in an urban area that could be leveraged for the monarch butterfly. Uh, the city of Austin also owns and operates 500 buildings and properties, ranging from libraries and police stations to Austin City Hall, uh, nature centers, science centers, and these new demonstration gardens, uh, new demonstration gardens in some of these prominent locations could really um, help engage thousands of citizens um, by promoting uh, the planting of milkweed and, and other pollinator friendly plants. And really the, there's, there's many different ways we can partner with municipalities. 
municipalities and, and work together on the local level. Um, I know that uh, Catherine with uh, the city of St. Louis uh, on the last webinar gave a great overview of their Milkweed for Monarchs program, which I think is a, a wonderful model to be replicated. And uh, some of these other examples I have in the slide, demonstration gardens, um, getting uh, mm -hmm. park department staff together uh, to look at revising, mowing schedules, updating weed ordinances, converting abandoned lots uh, to, to monarch habitat, and, and looking at landscaping ordinances. There's, there's many others. Um, and, and I just wanted to share um, some of those things that cities, towns, and neighborhoods can do for the monarch butterfly. I'm going to turn it back over now to uh, Mary Phillips for the last couple of slides. Thank you, Patrick. Um, as we mentioned earlier, uh, corridor and large landscapes are uh, uh, a key piece, and the communities one by one are filling in uh, those uh, wildlife corridors. So that's, that's just the, the bigger picture on that, and, and Patrick touched on many of these points. Overall, Garden for Wildlife, we're really looking right now, we're close to um, almost 200,000 habitats uh, across the country, and um, we're hoping to significantly increase those. Um, over the next, particularly next three years. And um, the key, as I said, the key components of that are the food, water, shelter, places to raise young, and sustainable practices, um, and also those education and awareness tools. Um, as convener stake stakeholders, we're hoping that part of, uh, as I mentioned earlier, to really get the numbers up and to get as many Americans as involved in creating monarch and pollinator habitat gardens, um, we helped convene the National Pollinator Garden Network that was announced um, this uh, June uh, by the First Lady. And we're very excited about that. And we are part of the Million Pollinator Garden Challenge. And really encourage any of you on the phone, if you're not already a part of that, um, to go to uh, millionpollinatorgardens.org and look at the other partners and um, see if there's a way you can get the word out to your networks uh, to uh, expand uh, this very important need. Um, here's some examples of some of the many partners that have joined on uh, nationally already. Um, we'd really like to thank you. Uh, this is, a, as you can tell, an a area that we're both passionate about, and we're very excited about taking the questions from all of you. Thanks, everybody. Um, thanks, Mary and Patrick and Donna, for sharing your expertise with us today. And, and I, I'm really appreciative for the information that you shared with the group. Um, thanks, everyone, for being here. We're going to stick around and do a, a question and answer period at the end. Um, but I just wanted to refresh a few things that we touched on earlier. If you have questions, I'm trying to follow up in the chat box, and, and we'll get to those. If you do want to review the webinar or other webinars that we've had in this series, we will archive them. Um, I shared a link earlier, but we'll send that out by email afterwards as well once the the webinar has been processed and is available for viewing. And um, I encourage you to ask questions today, but if we don't get to them, we'll, you know, peruse our website and, and see if you can find the answer there or shoot us an email. If you have feedback about today's webinar, feel free to reach out to us with that as well. Um, NCTC will send out a short survey by email, so we would love to hear your thoughts on that. So with that, I thank you all again for coming, and, and we'll move to a, a short question and answer period. I'm going to start with a, an easy question for Donna. You used the term wildflowers in a can, and I just wanted to um, see if you might expand more on, <laughs> describe what you actually meant by what are wildflowers in a can. Uh, years ago, it used to be wildflowers in a can. Sometimes you see wildflowers in a bag now. Um, very often Lowe's and Home Depot, Menards, uh, we have Flea Farm here in the Midwest, have a pre-mixed seed mix, which they call a wildflower seed mix. And very often um, it's deceiving because many people call wildflowers the naturalized weeds that grow along the roadside. So that's what's in these bags typically. Uh, you might find chicory and Queen Anne's lace, baby's breath, those sort of annual type plants typically, uh, plant uh, seeds, plant seeds in, in these um, mixtures. Once in a while you'll find some purple coneflower and maybe even some little blue stem. But again, little 
even though little blue stem is a native plant, it's not going to grow everywhere because it's very particular about the soil conditions, the amount of sun it gets, and the moisture it, it, it uh, needs in order to grow well. Uh, what we have found in the past is about 6% of the seed that is contained in these pre-mixes that are sold at the local hardware and uh, box stores is native plants. But that's not enough to sustain a community of plants that you might be trying to establish in a garden area. Thanks for that. Um, I also, for, for any of our presenters, wanted to see if you could expand on what time frames you recommend for best practices for planting or installing gardens, both with seeds and with, with, with plugs or some combination. If you, if you plant, do you have a recommendation for what's more successful in you know, planting in the fall or in the spring? Uh, well, in particular, uh, planting in the fall is a good time to plant shrubs. Uh, and uh, woody type uh, plants. Um, also, it's also a great time, uh, the end of summer, is to get uh, perennials, uh, native perennials that are kind of on their end of the season uh, clearance <laughs> at uh, various garden centers, um, particularly uh, the native plant nurseries and so forth um, that are, you know, ready to close those out. They're, it's really great to plant those in the fall and um, late summer. Uh, you have to keep them watered depending on your uh, heat and the uh, uh, levels uh, going into early fall, but it, they always come back, back brilliantly the next year. Um, and then for small seedlings and plugs, those do better in the early uh, spring and seeds as well. And you can also um, put seeds out in the fall um, for many plants as they need to stratify uh, during the cold weather, and then they will come up in the spring as well. If I could add just a few things, Wendy, this is Donna. Sure, go um, ahead. Um, one of the things that we encourage people to do is winter seeding. Uh, we don't want them to seed in the fall too early because if they get them into the ground before there's a, 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 um, a continuous frost, uh, they might germinate, uh, or if, if, particularly if we have a warm summer or lots of rain. And so it's better if they were to do a winter seeding. Um, the birds aren't going to, even though you might see it laying on the, uh, the snow, uh, the birds aren't going to eat the seed, uh, sufficient seed that it's going to disturb your plans as far as a garden. Um, also, in the spring, when we uh, talk to people about planting a garden, we typically ask them not to plant after May 15th or maybe May 30th because then you're starting to get into the dry season and that's going to delay the germination of the seed that you're going to put in the ground. That's a good point, Donna, if you don't mind me responding. Um, I think mm -hmm. that's good for the Midwest. Um, where we live on the Mid-Atlantic, most people aren't planting until after May 15th because there's still danger of frost. So it, it, it really varies regionally, I think, um, on that spring planting. That's a good point. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, moving on to our next totally unrelated question, um, there was a, a few different questions about different aspects of chemical application and neonic. Um, so I'm wondering if you guys have advice for um, the question was if if it was possible to detect overspray of neonics, which is is pretty hard, but um, I'm wondering if you could provide advice on things you might look for to determine if plants may have been either treated with neonics or um, potentially drift had impacted those plants. So are they talking about plants they're purchasing or plants out in the landscape that they're concerned about having done? Either. So, so if you're mm -hmm. purchasing plants, what might you look for if, if you can't get an answer from whoever you're purchasing them from or in the wild, are there any symptoms that you might look for um, that plants had been treated? Well, that's a bit of a challenge because it is so systemic, the impact, so it is sometimes hard to see. I think where there might be wildlife fallout, um, as, as the slides that Donna showed, I think are indicators, um, but it's not always obvious. Uh, unfortunately, that's part of the challenges of this uh, particular chemical. Uh, Donna, would you add anything there? 
Uh, yes, one of the things that we tell people is to look for um, holes in the leaves of plants. If you find holes in the leaves of plants, that means that the insects are munching on them. If you aren't going to find any damage like that, probably that means there is some reason they're not eating that plant. Or, uh, and I'm talking about native plants here. Um, and therefore, that might be an indication that it's been hit with some insecticide of some kind. Thanks, Donna. That's what I was looking for. <laughs> um, there was another question on pesticide. I might come back to that. Um, this is a question specifically for NWF, and I apologize for not knowing your requirements very well, but there was some concern about your requirement for certified, certified wildlife habitat um, providing water, and um, if that's an obstacle for city governments, what do you recommend? I'm, I'm just wondering if you could explain this to me a little bit more. I I'm, I'm apologize for not knowing your requirements very well. Sure. So water is one of the requirements that we request um, needs to be in a habitat. So it needs to be a source of water. It could be a bird bath. It could be a fountain. It could be a natural source um, of a stream um, or larger body of water nearby. So um, I think that's, that's what the requirements request. But it sounds like the question is, 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 is there an option for a city or municipality, and I might turn this over to Patrick, um, being challenged providing that water component. Is that something you run into, Patrick? Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, I, I think uh, for, for the majority of, of the municipalities and cities we work with, it's, it's not been an issue. Um, it, it, it's typically one of those, of the four elements, the one that, that may need to be added if it's not there naturally, but typically in a, a park or um, other uh, municipal grounds, there there may be a fountain or a bird bath already, or something like a bird bath or dish could be could be added to cover that requirement. It's it's not something we hear a lot about. Okay, um, we'll move on. There's a question about um, maintenance on the garden. So, what do you recommend? Are there are there tips or pointers for who is maintaining the gardens once you know, say in a community wide effort, if it's a public garden, how do you how do you make sure that that garden is maintained sufficiently? Yeah. Hi, this is Patrick. I, I can answer that on, you know, for for gardens that our, our communities create, um, for the, the majority of them, especially school gardens, there's a, a maintenance plan and a team that's developed even before the garden goes in the ground uh, to make sure that it will be um, upkept and, and running. Um, with a lot of our community wildlife habitat teams, um, they're working with um, volunteers of, of all different sorts. Um, to really maintain those uh, those gardens that are in public places. So if they are, you know, happen to be at a public park, Parks and Rec staff may have um, some training or background in making mm -hmm. sure the gardens get uh, maintained. And um, a lot of times uh, community volunteers um, or those that work with the community wildlife habitat team um, will, will help keep an eye on those other, other gardens in the community that may be uh, demonstration gardens or public gardens. Great. Um, Patrick, maybe another question for you. What kinds of community projects have been most successful in garnering participation by the public? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I think that um, we've seen uh, demonstration gardens at really high traffic areas being important, whether it's um, City Hall or um, a, a local zoo or aquarium or nature center. Um, we have a number of uh, communities that run uh, native plant garden tours in their cities and actually help uh, bring folks that are interested in gardening but maybe not so sure what um, wildlife or pollinator gardening looks like and um, actually bring them and, and show them some, some great models throughout the city. Um, th those have been um, uh, you know, a couple of, of the successful ways we've seen communities address it. Great. Mary or Donna, anything to add to community scale efforts? I think, uh, excuse me, this is Mary again. Um, the more that folks can rally around um, the individual species needs, like monarchs, is seen as a real rallying cry that inspired many of these gardens. And I think that's sometimes really bringing it down to the, the things that people can touch, feel, and see um, gets them to focus and zero in. And then those are very practical steps 
impacts on what a monarch or pollinators need. So it's, it's easier for groups of kids or groups of um, community members to, to kind of focus and zero in on that. And we found that uh, being very successful. I'd agree with that. Um, we have found, uh, since our partnership with Monarch Joint Venture, we have found um, that people rally around the monarchs so much more easily than they do just about native plants. Great. I'm going to ask one more question before we wrap it up. I want to end it with what advice do you guys have? I've been getting a couple questions on um, different aspects, but but what are the most appropriate ways for people to reach out to their city officials or reach out to the community if they want to change some practice, say it's spraying or mowing? Um, do you have sort of best management or best practices, best advice for how they most effectively do that? This is Donna. I would like to recommend that people go to our website and under the Learn tab, there's a link to weed laws and ordinances, and we have a great deal of information on there about what other communities have done, what has been successful. There's a how-to uh, article there on how to get, uh, how to begin that process, exactly what you mentioned, how, who to approach, how to rally support, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I guess the, the big thing is that regardless of what, what it is that you're trying to change, not being angry about it or not trying to put people on the defense about what it is that you want to change within your municipality is the most important thing I can tell anyone. They need to go to the municipality, probably their planning committee or commission um, or their zoning commission, and that's where they'll need to start. But they need to go with an open mind and a friendly presence and... Um, show them that they're the good guy, and that'll go so much further than going in with a, a really angry attitude. I, I think Donna made tremendous points, and the Wild Ones resources are really um, fantastic. So I, I would agree approaching the municipality in that way and, and with that mindset um, is, is really um, terrific. And also talking to your neighbors and others um, about their, their experience and, and um, how they're working with the municipality. But I, I think that's, um, that's really perfect. We, we do, through the Community Habitat Program, also uh, network folks who are having that issue and uh, to those who have successfully um, taken it on before. But, but great question, and, and thank you for it. Thanks. Well, with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap things up. Um, I'm, I apologize for not getting to everyone's questions, but I, I, copied, a, I copied the script and and I'm going to try to translate some of the questions to the Frequently Asked Questions page of the Monarch Joint Venture website. So refer to that resource down the road if, if you want to follow up about answers to some of these questions um, and, and for other resources that we offer as well, in addition to those offered by Wild Ones and the National Wildlife Federation. So thank you all again for, for sticking with us today, and, and we look forward to seeing you on the next webinar.